Hello everyone, and welcome back to Scary Interesting. In this video, we're going to look at two stories of people who went diving and then captured everything on camera just moments before something horrifying happened. As always, viewer discretion is advised. Take a look at this video. For those of you just listening, it is a video of several divers swimming close together in deep green water. The water is fairly cloudy, and the divers are swimming along the top of some sort of structure, passing by these dark open windows. This was filmed in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Portugal at the site of a shipwreck. As the divers swim around, you can see the ship start to take shape, and it's clearly been at the bottom for quite a while, based on the amount of growth on the deck and hull. Incredibly, although the weather that day above the surface was a sweltering 38 Celsius or 100 Fahrenheit, the temperature at 30 meters or 100 feet deep where this was filmed was just a few degrees above freezing. Cold enough that it would be like taking an ice bath if you weren't wearing a wetsuit. The person filming this video was named Callum, and at the time the video was taken, he was 17 years old on holiday with his parents from England. Both of Callum's parents were divers, and they'd often go on vacation on boats in the Red Sea. And a year earlier, Callum also started to learn to dive like his parents, and his dad took him to the island of Rhodes near Greece to get training. There, he learned basic paddy training in the clear, calm, and temperate water of the Mediterranean. Then after returning to England, he continued his training in freshwater lakes. They weren't as clear or as warm as where he first learned, but they were good enough to keep practicing. Now, around the time Callum was first learning, he was very lean. People who are very lean often have trouble with buoyancy because they lack the less dense fat mass to help them float. Because of this, Callum was basically neutrally buoyant in freshwater with a wetsuit on, and so he only needed a little 2 kilogram weight belt to help him sink. This is sort of an unusually small amount of weight compared to most people. A little over a year later, he and his parents arrived in Portugal, where they had booked two days to go diving around the coast and see some shipwrecks. Then they took a boat from the coast out to the spot in the water where the ships were submerged and got suited up for their dive. By then, since it had been some time since Callum had dived, he was given a slightly heavier 6 kilogram weight belt to compensate for any weight gain and the slightly denser salt water. In addition to that, in the past, he was prone to feeling some of the effects of nitrogen in regular air, and for whatever reason, seemed to consume air more quickly than most people. So for this trip, he was going to be using a mixture known as nitrox. This gas is a slightly higher concentration of oxygen, which would hopefully prevent him from feeling impaired like he might with regular air at depth. He'd also take a larger 15 liter tank instead of a standard 12 liter, adding another 5 kilos of additional load, but would also give him some extra time to spare. Unfortunately, between the heavier tank and the heavier weight belt, he was significantly less buoyant than he'd been in the past. Meaning, he was like dead weight in the water without his buoyancy device filled, which is something he only realized once he was in the water. But either way, shortly afterward, the divers began to descend from the boat down to 30 meters or 100 feet toward the shipwreck. As they descended, along with the light dimming above them, they could see that visibility was poor due to a recent undersea earthquake. This is when the video began to be recorded. At first, Callum was with his father, and the rest of the divers were split into five groups to swim around and explore. As they reached the deck of the ship, Callum and his father entered the large engine room to check out the ship's massive engine. Then they swam toward the front of the ship through the dark hallways, using their torches to light the way. Their plan was to follow the hallway all the way up to the bridge and then out to regroup and resurface. Callum's father was in front and then Callum was close behind. Eventually, they went through a few turns and then Callum came to the foot of a ladder. He quickly looked up to see where it went and then turned to leave to keep following his father, but as he did, his wetsuit snagged on a piece of metal. He then turned around to free himself, but as he did, accidentally managed to roll himself onto his back because of the extra weight he had on him. The way his tank and belt were positioned put his center of gravity right around his lower back, making it feel like someone was physically holding onto his hips and pulling him down. Then instead of using the ladder to pull himself back upright, he instinctively began to kick his legs to right himself like you'd normally do during a dive. Unfortunately, in the narrow hallway, he couldn't spin himself around and all of the kicking disturbed all the silt on the hallway floor. So realizing he was making things worse, he finally reached for the ladder and then tried to pull himself up, but again, due to his buoyancy, this didn't help at all. So finally, frustrated, he stopped for a second, sat there, and then inflated his buoyancy control device. Then he reached for the ladder again and got himself into a standing position. Up to this point, he hadn't really been worried and was more just focused on getting himself upright. But as soon as he was standing, effectively blind in the dark green silt, panic just set in out of nowhere. 
Immediately, he shined his light around and banged his tank against the ladder to try to make noise to signal his father, but because he also couldn't see his father's light anywhere, he realized he was probably too far to see what was happening. And even worse, even if his father was close by, in all the silt, he had no idea where to go, or even if he was facing the right direction. As he was looking around, he realized that he could just stay still and wait for the silt to dissipate, so he checked his dive watch to see how far into the dive they were. By then, they were 12 minutes in, so he had plenty of time to just sit for a minute and let visibility improve. Then he checked his pressure gauge though and realized he had somehow already gone through over half the gas in his tank. Because he had no idea how long it would take for visibility to improve, and then how long it would take to get out of the ship and then up to the surface, he was at risk of getting dangerously low on gas. So instead, he decided the best thing to do was to try to search for the hallway they'd been heading down and get to the bridge where his father would be waiting. Then, keeping his hand along the wall to guide himself, he started heading in the direction he thought was right. This continued for what felt like forever, and during which, the panic just kept getting worse and worse, and he knew that every breath was one breath close to suffocation, which only sped his breathing up despite his effort to keep it under control. Finally though, the silt lightened, and then he cleared it and came to an opening which led outside. Then he repositioned himself and then squeezed through the opening and sort of fell through it. With everything going on, the transition into the much brighter water only further disoriented him. He then looked around and had no idea which section of the ship he was at, and because of the poor visibility, he couldn't even see the ocean floor, so he had no idea which direction was up. Thankfully, he had the wherewithal to watch his bubbles to reorient himself, and then began banging his tank on the side of the wreck, hoping to attract any of the other divers. Then he waited for a moment and checked his air gauge once again and saw that he was at just a quarter of his tank left. If he didn't find someone soon, he'd have to ascend alone immediately and risk being swept away in the ocean currents without the line to guide him. When no one came in response to the sound he was making, he started ascending up the side of the wreck until he could see he was somewhere near the bow. Then he swam down the length of the deck to the bridge to find his father, but his father was likely still waiting inside for him. He contemplated going back in again to meet up with him, but decided against it because of the possibility of getting lost again. Instead, he decided to go to the middle of the boat where the dive leader was waiting for everyone to finish. As this was going on, he knew that the amount he had left in his tank was the point where you need to ascend immediately to avoid running out. If he didn't find someone else soon, he'd have no choice but to ascend, and he didn't even know if that would be enough because he was below that point. Thankfully, as he made his way to the middle of the ship, he spotted the faintest shimmer of bubbles. He headed directly toward it and found a group of divers. At this point, the panic was enough that he was actually finding it hard to breathe through his regulator, likely because of how hard he was breathing. Somehow though, he managed to signal to one of the divers to see their pressure gauge and saw they had over half their tank left. Then he showed the diver his gauge and managed to communicate that he needed some of their gas. The diver understood his communication and untied their spare regulator, known as an octopus. Then Callum removed his regular from his mouth, but cold seawater immediately flooded his mouth and nose. Closer to the surface, you can hold air in your mouth, but that deep in the water, the pressure causes your mouth and nose to flood almost immediately, which he had no idea. This then forced his airways closed because of a reflex known as a laryngospasm. As you might imagine, between everything going on, this was so shocking that his mind just went blank and all he could think was air and tried to swim to the surface without a regulator in his mouth. Thankfully, as he began to kick, the other divers grabbed onto him and held him in place to keep him from ascending. Then, one of them took the octopus and tried to force it into his mouth, but because Callum was in such a panic, he thought if he opened his mouth, he'd drown, so he clenched his jaw shut and pushed the other diver's arm away. This was then followed by his diaphragm spasming as his lungs were desperately trying to breathe, and dots started to appear in his vision. Then, as if it was said by someone else, a voice in the back of his head said, you're going to die if you don't calm down. And just like that, he snapped out of his panic and all the sensation flooded back all over his body. He could feel how wide and dry his eyes were and the pain in his teeth from how hard his jaw was clenched. Then he felt the cold water against his face and closed his eyes to give himself a moment to calm down. Finally, he opened his eyes and calmly signaled the diver to pass in the regulator. Then he placed it into his mouth and let out a weak cough to clear the water from his mouth. This was then followed by the deepest shuddering breath he'd ever taken. Even the gas was cold and hurt his airways like the pain from a brain freeze. It was unlike any breath he'd taken before or since, and it was like he was breathing for the first time ever in his life. After that, he took some long, deep breaths while the other divers hovered around him and made sure he was okay. Then, once he was calm, they moved toward the dive line to wait for the others. While they waited, they began picking up mussels that were on the hull of the boat, cracking them open to feed the fish swimming around which is obviously a stark contrast to the situation he was in just moments earlier. 
Then, finally, his father came over and he took a deep breath and switched to his father's spare regulator. Afterward, they ascended the line without issue and even went for a second dive later that day. They would even go for two more dives the following day, although he hasn't gone again since he got back from the trip. There is a video circulating around the internet that at first glance seems incredibly sweet and romantic. In the video, a man wearing blue swim shorts, a mask, and flippers can be seen swimming underwater up to a window. He then presses a piece of paper and a watertight Ziploc bag to the glass, and the woman filming begins to giggle behind the camera. What the note said was, I can't hold my breath long enough to tell you everything I love about you, but everything I love about you, I love more every day. The woman responds with an awe and keeps giggling. Then the man turns the paper around, and on the back, he wrote, Will you please be my wife? Marry me. Then he reaches into a shorts pocket, takes out a case, and opens it up to show her a wedding ring. The woman then screams in joy as the man swam up and out of view of the camera, and that's where the video ends. The man in that video is Steven Weber, and the woman's name is Kanisha Antoine. This was supposed to be the most romantic moment of both their lives, but instead, it became the most tragic. The two met while Steven was DJing two years earlier in 2017 and quickly fell madly in love. Steven was known in Louisiana DJ circles as the real Steven, whereas Kanisha was an accomplished lawyer running her own notary and legal service. This might not seem like a good match on the surface, but in addition to their personalities just meshing well, they both had a passion for giving back to their community, Baton Rouge. So while Steven DJed at night, his day job was at St. Christopher's Addiction Center where he helped people break the addiction cycle. Meanwhile, in addition to being a lawyer, Kanisha volunteered and worked with several nonprofit organizations which aimed to protect the rights of people with mental and physical disabilities. And despite living in the same spot all their lives, they also liked to travel every chance they got, exploring the world together and getting out of Louisiana. Time away from work mattered a lot to Kanisha, and there was one place she had always really wanted to go. So in 2019, with her 40th birthday just around the corner, Stephen decided to book them on the trip of a lifetime to Tanzania. Stephen then booked his dog into a kennel, and the two set off in early September 2019 for this magical trip. The first part was a safari vacation on the mainland, then at the end of that, they checked into the Manta Resort on Pemba Island off the coast. And their room at the resort was nothing short of spectacular. It was actually a wooden cabin floating in the ocean but anchored to the sea floor. In it, there were three levels. At the top was a daybed where they could bathe in the sun by day and look up at the stars at night. Beneath that was a lounge room with doors that could be opened completely to let the ocean in. And then the coolest part was that they could climb down 30 feet down a ladder to the stunning underwater bedroom. In it, they could watch sea life swim by through glass on all sides. Now, because of all these features, it was by far the most expensive part of the trip. Just one night at the cabin cost $1,800, but it was worth it because Stephen wanted everything to be perfect. And despite the trip being a year in the making, Stephen had managed to keep the most important part of it a secret. On the last day, in that beautiful cabin, he planned to make the trip of a lifetime even better by proposing to the love of his life. They checked in on September 19th, and the two were just blown away by the cabin. Kanisha checked around the upstairs parts, and then they both dropped into the bedroom, laughing at the fish they could see and amazed that a place like that even existed. A little later, Stephen crept up the ladder, took the wedding ring and piece of paper with the messages written on it out of their hiding place. Then he slipped on his mask and flippers, and then dropped into the ocean. When Kanisha saw him in the water outside the window, she picked up her phone and began filming. After Stephen proposed, Kanisha stopped filming and then ran up the ladder to the first floor to greet her new fiancé, but Stephen didn't resurface. Then she ran up to the top floor to see if he drifted out a little, but he wasn't there either. This made no sense because she'd just seen him swim up. She could basically see the surface from the point he went out of view, but there was no sign of him. Immediately, she began to scream, and then she screamed loud enough that locals in boats came over to find out what was wrong. The men in those boats dived down, desperate to find him before it was too late. And eventually, one of them did, but tragically, Stephen was already dead. As you might imagine, this was beyond devastating for Kanisha. Later on Facebook, she wrote to him and said, quote, You never got to hear my answer. Yes, yes, a million times yes. We never got to embrace and celebrate the beginning of the rest of our lives together, as the best day of our lives turned into the worst, in the cruelest twist of fate imaginable. To this day, it remains a mystery why Stephen died. One thought is that he got so excited during the proposal that he misjudged how long he could hold his breath and blacked out as he swam back up. In the aftermath, Kanisha and her family left his page and the photos of their time together in Tanzania on Facebook as a memorial to him. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. I also want to give a huge shout out to Callum for sending in his story and the video to go along with it. Often on this channel, the people in the stories have passed away and their thoughts and intentions can be hard to know. 
and I think there's something uniquely harrowing about getting a survivor's perspective. Also, in case you were wondering, Calum didn't capture the whole incident on camera, just the moments leading up to it. In any case, if you want to support the channel, give this video a like, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.